electoral integrity. Now, let's get reaction to what we heard today. It was the blueprint of the government, so let's get opposition reaction to start. Earlier, I spoke with the leader of the official opposition, Tom Mulcair. Trump up. It's an attempt to try to change the channel from the scandal in the Senate, of course, because a lot of them are NDP ideas. I can tell you that the government has voted against them each and every time they've been put forward over the course of the last eight years. The real show was taking place at the scene of the crime in the Senate. Stephen Harper is again trying to get out of Dodge. He was supposed to be only in one question period this week. He's decided that even that's too much for him. He's found an excuse to hop on Con Air and get out of town. It's, it's shameful behavior. Sure, viewers understand he's le he'll be leaving tomorrow for two days in Belgium with the uh, president of the European Funny Commission how that works, trying uh, to tie up loose ends on this free trade deal with Europe. Yeah, uh, it's transparent. It's a, it's a cowardly attempt to skip out on his responsibilities and his obligation to show up in the House of Commons and answer questions for what he did last spring, which was to mislead Canadians. Stephen Harper made a clear statement that only Nigel Wright was aware of what was going on in his office. Official RCMP documents tabled during the summer make it quite clear that that was false. And we had every reason to want to question him about that tomorrow. Let, 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 let me play devil's advocate here. So if he's close to a trade deal... I, I hope that doesn't mean you're advocating for the Conservatives. I, 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 I use the term and we'll take it from there. But So, you know, he, if he's close to a deal, feels he has to go. I mean, if he's back Monday, what's the difference in a couple of days to get at questions about the Senate? Yeah, it's a, it's a patent attempt to avoid responsibility, and that's all this is about. By the way, there's no such thing as an interim deal, a proposed deal, an agreement in principle. In international trade, you either have a deal or you don't, and then you head through to your own ratification process. If Stephen Harper has a deal and he claims that he has one, he should be putting it before the Canadian people. So even more so, he should be in, front, in the Parliament of Canada talking about the contents of it. It doesn't belong to him. It doesn't belong to the Conservative Party. It belongs to Canadians who have a right to judge it on its merits. Okay, what about uh, the content of some of the stuff you heard? Is there, what's, what's particularly worrisome to an NDP leader, to the leader of the official opposition and what you heard today in this speech from the throne? Well, again, Canadians have to look at what they're proposing and what their attitude has, to, has been in the past to find out whether it's believable or not. So let's take one specific example that everybody will understand. Something called pay to pay. So a lot of companies were charging an extra two, three dollars for you to get a bill on paper because not everybody's savvy with computers, right. as you know. So it was unfair for computers, uh, for computers, for consumers, and we put that before the parliament. We sent it over to the, the conservatives, and you know what they said? We don't want to do that. Now they say that they want to do it. So we'll be able to show you that, their answer to us when we put it forward. They have no credibility on it. Okay, so, so how does that translate moving forward then? So, so if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're saying you're a Canadian watching that speech today and it all sounds good, what are you watching for to see? If they're ever going to do it. So let's take a specific example on something on which they could move tomorrow. They said they want to put an end to cyberbullying. Right. Using the internet. Using a cell phone to attack someone, to hurt them. Well, my friend and colleague Robert Chisholm, because he knew the Retea Parsons family and has met with them, put forward a bill to do just that. Are the Conservatives honest when they say that? Are they credible? Are they sincere? Bring it before the House tomorrow. We're willing to adopt it, one, two, three. You know what? They're not going to do that because they're not sincere. So it's all about politics. It's all about positioning. They have no credibility on these issues. All right. Let's say you have predicted that you will form the next government in this country in 2015, and the Conservatives are promising between now and then to introduce and pass a balanced budget law that would force you never to run into deficit in, in good times. And if you do have to run, run a deficit, in bad times, there'll be a fixed plan, and of course we haven't seen the details yet, a fixed plan to get the books back to balance. What about that approach? Do you like the sound of that? Well, the best record, and it's not my opinion, it's published by the Canadian Finance Department, the best record for balanced budgets of all political parties are with the NDP. So we've got a proud history of that. Let's look at the Conservative record. The previous record for the largest deficit was held by the Conservatives under Brian Mulroney. That record was recently beaten by the Conservatives under Stephen Harper. Since they came to power, they've racked up $166 billion in new debt for our country. So the Conservatives have absolutely no lessons to serve up to anybody else on balanced budgets. The NDP has a proud history of balancing the books. That's the proud history of good, 
competent public administration that we'll bring to the job when we form the first NDP government in 2015. So would you, would you be in favor of enshrining that proud history in law? Well, once we finish laughing at the Conservatives even, dare, even daring to raise it, we'll look at what's in the bill. And probably, since we do have the best track record of balanced budgets, we'll be more than willing to move that type of thing forward. It's okay, been so done in the you past. You don't object to that idea in principle. Well, Not in principle, because we've got the best track record. The Conservatives have the worst track record. Okay, let's talk about this. Canada, one of the other things, of course, is getting lots of headlines, and it's... It, it, it sort of resonates on, I, I think, on both sides of the debate. Some Canadians will say yes, and other Canadians will question the idea that uh, a tough on crime, piece of tough-on-crime legislation that says if you're a, a serious criminal sentenced to life in prison, that you will serve life in prison, and that's that. Where do you stand on that? For eight years, the Conservatives, every couple of months, come up with their newest tough-on-crime proposal. When you look at it, Ask the chiefs of police, ask experts in criminology. It's all just smoke and mirrors. None of it is to be believed. They're not credible on that. None of this stuff actually plays out in the real world. They want to get tough on crime, bring in Robert Chisholm's anti-cyberbullying bill. Tomorrow we'll adopt it, one, two, three. Otherwise, it's just more red meat for the reform party base, not something they ever have any intention right, of doing. Specifically, where do you stand on the idea that a life sentence means a life sentence? I stand on the idea that Canada used to have one of the best track records in the world for balancing repression and the hope of rehabilitation. Under the Conservatives, playing to that political base, they've lost that balanced approach and it's playing tricks on us. Our prisons are overcrowded. We're hurting our society by putting people back in the street who haven't been rehabilitated because we're taking the money out of that. We need that balanced approach. Repression, yes, also rehabilitation. Okay, let's, let's finish on this. Uh, give you the opportunity to say if you had uh, crafted this speech from the throne, and I don't expect you to give me an hour's worth of speech from the throne, but what's missing from it that should have been in it? No reference to getting back to a balanced approach with regard to taxation in Canada. Since the Conservatives arrived, they hollowed out the government's ability to provide services to the public by hollowing out its fiscal capacity. They gave $50 billion a year tax breaks to Canada's richest corporations. Corporations are not paying their fair share of taxes in our country. Individuals do pay their fair share of taxes. It's getting back to a balance there as well. But the Conservatives have brought everything out of balance. Almost all of the things they say they want to do now because of problems are to treat problems that they've caused. They got rid of environmental legislation in Canada. Now they have the temerity to come back and say, oh, they want to bring in polluter pay. The reason that it's not there is that they removed it. They, again, on that issue, have no credibility whatsoever, no real intention of doing anything, and that's where the NDP comes in. We have credibility, we've got a track record, and Canadians know that we can be relied upon to provide good, capable public administration. The only powerful any interest any member of my cabinet is ever going to be asked to serve is the public interest. All right. Uh, Tom O'Care, leader of the official opposition, always a pleasure. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks, Peter.